The party is finally over. The king is dead. The lights are off in the Playboy Mansion, and all that's left are the stories of how Hugh Hefner, the godfather of sex and his vision of bountiful free love, had conquered a nation. And created a life of barely believable glamour in the process. Except that it wasn't. The sexy fairy tale Hep would have you believe in was a bedazzled, twisted, toxic prison. And I know that because I spent six years as girlfriend number one to a man old enough to be my grandfather. How could I justify such a thing? I'm here for adventure, a once-in-a-lifetime experience. I'm here as a stepping stone to something else, I told myself. And even perhaps the biggest illusion of all, I'm here for love. Deeper and deeper I fell down the rabbit hole. My story wasn't atypical, a small-town girl who dreamt of becoming someone special. I moved to Los Angeles to go to college and got a job waitressing at the Hooters bar, featuring busty waitresses, a job that resulted in an invitation to a party at the Playboy Mansion. For a starstruck girl from Oregon, this felt like the chance of a lifetime. The dress code was strict, sleepwear required. Despite having very little income, I bought a lingerie set from Fredericks of Hollywood, a black satin corset with matching garter belts, thigh high stockings, and a short silk robe. When I arrived with my friend Heather, every inch of the estate seemed to sparkle. Oh my god, there's Cameron Diaz, Heather said, pointing to a tall, beautiful blonde. Next to her was Jim Carrey. Across the pool, Heather spotted Leonardo DiCaprio. It was a who's who of Hollywood. We walked through the infamous candlelit grotto, still empty at this early hour, and the zoo. Everything looked so sensuous and inviting. Tucked away in a corner of a tent, our host looked gloomy for a man flanked by two of the most breathtaking beauties I had ever seen. My first thought was that he was out of it. WASE senile? Or just bored? Maybe Mr. Playboy would suggest I audition for his magazine. Hi, I'm Holly, I said. What's that? He asked. I'm Holly. I repeated, a little louder. Oh, hi. Nice to meet you, darling, Hef said before turning his attention to the next person. Oh well, I thought, I gave it a shot. Somehow my presence had been overlooked. But there were more invitations, more parties, and a year later, I had become something of a fixture at the mansion. What wasn't to love? Bigginess, drinks, food, music, and friends. It was a life so unlike my own that I almost envied the women who called this magical place home. I was flattered to be one of 20 or so girls invited to the smaller Sunday pool parties. When the light dipped below the hills, the festivities moved inside. Eventually, his harem of girlfriends would trickle down to take their seats next to Hef at the dining table. I could never understand their lack of enthusiasm. Initially, 
I assume they were spoiled, jaded, or just not a good fit in Hef's world. This may sound naive, but I didn't immediately realize that they were actually required to sleep with him. My main focus was pursuing an acting career, but it's almost unsettling how quickly your priorities can shift. The desire to perform is what had first driven me to Los Angeles, and, as the lease on my apartment neared its end, the thought of returning home almost killed me. He started to wonder, couldn't Playboy help me reach that goal? The more time I spent there, the whole girlfriend thing began to look appealing. Around that time, I was invited to join Hef on one of his bi-weekly club nights. I was one of the first to step out of the limo, and every set of eyes turned to check if I was someone worth knowing. When Hef finally emerged from the car, the crowd went wild. He lifted a hand as if he were some kind of dignitary. We were whisked away to a private area next to the dance floor. To an outsider, it must have looked incredibly glamorous, seven beautiful women dancing away behind velvet ropes with private table service to cater to our every desire, all at Hef's expense. But if you looked close enough, each girl appeared to be just a little bit vacant. When Hef stood up to dance, his rhythm was so off that I let out a big laugh. I wondered why these women didn't care enough to protect him from the embarrassment, surely they owed him that. Back at the table, he leaned towards me with a bunch of large horse pills in his hands. Would you like a quaalude? Hef asked. No thanks. I answered cheerfully. I don't do drugs. That's good, he said nonchalantly. Usually I don't approve, but in the 70s they used to call these pills thigh openers. Today, I want to scream pause and freeze frame that moment in late August 2001. I want to grab that young girl, shake her and demand, what the hell are you thinking? Why didn't I run for the nearest exit? I suppose I had already made up my mind at that point. If I became a girlfriend, I would have somewhere to live. If I became part of Playboy's inner circle, perhaps that could help my career. Oh, and the limo ride back to the mansion, Candace leaned over and whispered to me that all of the girls were expected to join Hef in his bedroom. Foolishly, I was extremely drunk, and what happened next is best not dwelt upon. Suffice it to say that the next morning, I felt terrible, and it wasn't just the hangover. I was freaked out and ashamed. It might be hard to understand, but in that moment, I didn't blame Hef for the creepy night before. He had the nice guy act down pat. Besides, I was young, vulnerable, and foolish, and I needed somewhere to stay. Can I ask you something? He looked up, and I told him that I had no place to live. What do you think about me moving? And he paused and replied, You can stay for a while and we'll see how it works out. No one gave me a tour of the mansion, so I kept discovering new places for myself. The 
the secret passage from the main house to the gym, the panel in the living room wall that revealed a secret wine cellar used as a speakeasy in the 1920s. There was an attic office with adjacent bathroom that looked like a time capsule with gold shag carpet and an untouched tray of toiletries from the 1970s. The taps were naked ladies. The mansion may have looked up like 1970s foreign chic, but it was neglected. There were nine dogs, and the ancient yellow carpet on the grand staircase was covered in their urine stains. There was a strict routine. Monday was manly night when Hef would have his male friends over for a movie. Tuesday was family night for his wife and two sons. Wednesday and Friday were club nights. On Thursday, like Monday and Tuesday, we could do as we pleased. Saturday was a buffet dinner and movie with Hef. Sunday was a pool party during the day and dinner and a movie at night. There were many rules. First, there was a curfew. Hef required his girlfriends to be in by 9 p.m. We were not allowed to fraternize with the staff. Each girlfriend was given a weekly clothing allowance of $1,000. The last major requirement was that girlfriends attend all Hef's events. I was too naive to realize it at the time, but Hef wanted to have us wallowing in our own insecurities and playing for his acceptance. Girlfriends that didn't get along gave him the feeling of being fought over and desired, something he was desperate to feel in his old age. I'd always been confident, but it didn't take long for my self-worth to start to crumble. He was cruelly manipulative, happy to reduce me to tears. Don't ever wear red lipstick again, he once warned me in a low voice. You look old, hard, and cheap. I was so constantly on edge that I eventually developed a stammer, so I tried as best I could to stay quiet. To Hef, this was a sign of submission that helped me become one of his favorites. And I developed my own brand of Stockholm Syndrome, identifying with my captor. It didn't seem to matter that I couldn't recall how or why. I in less than a year, Hef had promoted me to his main girlfriend. There was nothing ceremonial.